Just in moments ago, Elsa, still a Category 1 hurricane hitting Tampa Bay at this hour, but showing promising signs of a potential weakening that the NHC says will continue through to a Wednesday landfall in Florida. The latest models plus a meteorologist Q&A starts now here on Tracking the Tropics. Hey there, everybody. JB Buno back with you here again in your hurricane headquarters. Uh, there's some good news to get to here, buddy, on Tracking the Tropics at this hour as Elsa continues to make its presence felt here in Tampa Bay. Great to have back on the program. Addis Duclo joining us from WHTM, ABC 27, meteorologist up there in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Addis, of course, joining us last year, everybody here on Tracking the Tropics. We'll be hearing from him, tap into his expertise and experience here momentarily but first want to let you know that we're going to be taking your questions here everybody in a meteorologist Q&A coming up here in about five or so minutes time it'll be myself and Addis taking your questions you can use hashtag hey Addis hashtag hey JB in the Facebook live comment section we'll be featuring those comments and answering those questions live but before we do so Tracking the Tropics meteorologist Ian Oliver standing by in front of infrared satellites showing Elsa at this hour and we just got in that new data we were just talking about here at 11 o'clock Ian. Thanks a lot, JB. Good evening. You and I have been staring at this storm for three days now. Over the last few hours, we've seen some very interesting trends. Great news, at least in the short term. You can't see on the infrared satellite some of those darker reds really starting to fade. We had that center of circulation that when approaching coastal waters off of Sarasota just a couple of hours ago looked really ominous. We had this burst of convection, intense lightning, especially on the northern and eastern side of that center of circulation. You can see this. This is Hurricane Elsa, latest update from the National Hurricane Center, 11 p.m. advisory. They've left maximum sustained winds at 75 miles per hour, minimum threshold for a Category 1 hurricane. Very low end at this point. They've noted that inside that inner core, you can see here just over the last hour or so how that dark red indicating the stronger thunderstorms have really dropped out towards the center, the core of this system. Now, that being said, we're still seeing some stronger bands moving on shore. With that, some gustier winds. In fact, we just had a gust in Sarasota with... Uh, this band that moved on through in excess of 55 miles per hour. So that was a very healthy wind gust with that strong rain band that moved on shore in Sarasota County. So still a well-formed tropical storm, at least here. The possibility that it's not quite at that Category 1 intensity, but the threats as we move on through the next few hours, those are still there, especially coastal flooding. That's been the main concern all along with this system. The wind field is still there, and once that center of circulation gets north of the bay especially, we'll start seeing that wind direction shift to the west and southwest, pushing water onto our coastline and into the bay. And with that high tide cycle, really between midnight and 3 a.m., that's where we're thinking we'll see the biggest concerns with potential coastal flooding and sea level rise. So we'll be watching that. Wanted to show you this, though, with the tropical moisture. This is water vapor imagery. We talked about the structure of this storm not really being great this whole time over the last few days. A lopsided system that really struggled to get that classic tropical cyclone structure over the last few days. That, I believe, allowed some of this drier air on the western and southwestern side of the storm to get pulled into that center of circulation, which kind of choked off some of those showers and thunderstorms, at least in the short term, dropping the intensity of this system. This is the forecast path. This is a new forecast cone with the 11 o'clock advisory from the National Hurricane Center. You see that cone just brushing now the Pinellas County coastline. That doesn't matter because we know this is a lopsided system and the worst of it is well off to the east of that center. We're obviously seeing the showers and thunderstorms that we're tracking on Max Defender 8. That path taking it towards an eventual landfall looks like in Levy County early tomorrow morning. So we'll be watching for that. Then an inland track. This is something else we've been watching over the last few days, JB. The trends when it moves beyond our area. A couple days ago, it was looking like a path more offshore of Georgia and the Carolinas, which would tap back in to those very warm sea surface temperatures closer to the Gulf Stream. That looks very unlikely at this point. It'll be an inland track, still bringing the possibility of some power outages, some gusty showers and thunderstorms that could create some issues but not the worst case scenario with this should this have hugged the coast and then tapped into some of that extra energy. Closer to home across Tampa Bay area again, 
That's 8 a.m. right there. We're offshore of Citrus County, northern part of the Tampa Bay area, and likely moving on shore in Levy County, perhaps as far north as Dixie County. See the forecast models? These are in excellent agreement at this point, taking it in that direction. That forecast is very high confidence at this point, likely a still a high-end tropical storm at that point with max winds that were forecast, likely in the 65 to 70 range. Want to point this out. This is also new. Areas north of I-4, earlier we were telling you that you could expect to see that tornado watch extended farther to the north. It now does include the nature coast. Citrus, Hernando, Pasco included in this tornado watch. Whole area has been extended until 8 a.m. We know with these tropical systems, there's a lot of spin in the atmosphere. We're still seeing some of those stronger rain bands moving on shore with a little shear in them keeping the possibility of an isolated tornado. I do think it's a lower end threat at this point, but it's there and we'll be tracking it for you with Max Defender 8 through the overnight hours tonight. Quick brush up on the alerts. We've got the hurricane warning, coastal Hillsborough, all of Pinellas, coastal areas, Pasco, Hernando, and Citrus, the tropical storm warning for inland areas and southern spots, and it's the storm surge warning. This has always been the biggest threat with this system. It's always the biggest threat with any tropical system it's storm surge, sea level rise, and we still see that threat. Even with that inner core struggling a bit, the wind field is still there, and that's still going to push some water toward us. So southern spots, you see that possibility of one to three feet of storm surge with that high tide cycle between midnight and 3 a.m. In the bay, similar conditions expected. Watch for some of that water rise, especially if you live in one of the typical trouble spots. We have plenty of them across the Tampa Bay area. And then up into Hernando and Citrus County. This is closer to that inner core, which still has a strong wind field. That's where we could see some tallies, likely in excess of three feet, three to as much as five feet of sea level rise. So if you live in one of those areas, vulnerable to storm surge flooding, be very mindful as we head towards that high tide cycle tonight. So this is a look right now, a live picture at Max Defender 8. Certainly no shortage of rainfall across the area. We've had a lot of that lately. You see some of these heavier bands, Hillsboro extending down into Hardy and Highlands, Sarasota, the band that produced that big wind gust, still producing heavy rainfall through a good portion of Sarasota County. But Addis, we've liked the trends that we've seen certainly coming back to max defender rate with that inner core over the last hour, hour and a half. And we're certainly uh, hoping that that'll persist. Yeah, we've been watching those trends here uh, over the last couple of hours on the satellite. And you can really tell just by seeing how the cloud tops are now warming. So typically when we're talking about a strong hurricane, you tend to see these very cold cloud tops kind of wrapping themselves all around the center of the storm. So we're seeing the opposite happening right now. The cloud tops are warming. Now, again, that doesn't mean that the storm is necessarily falling apart. It's just that we're losing that inner core. We are seeing some additional newer thunderstorm development now to the south of St. Pete. So that's where we do start to see some colder cloud tops where you see the red there on the radar. Looks like Sarasota and points south there on I-75. That is that next band that we are watching closely. And with that, we are going to see torrential downpours. And notice, too, how all of that activity is training over the same areas. And that's not the only band that we're talking about. We're talking about that next band to the north, closer to Tampa, Newport Ritchie. That's the uh, initial band that's going to be rotating in. And then there's that following band coming to the north. So this is definitely going to be slow moving overnight when it comes to these rain bands. So even though we've seen good trends on the satellite imagery, that doesn't necessarily mean the rain is falling the, the rain is falling apart. It's certainly still there. It's just the core of the storm has struggled a bit, at least in terms of the strongest of the wind field. Again, Addis Juco joining us, everybody from WHTM in Pennsylvania, where, uh, again, uh, Elsa is expected to uh, make its presence felt there in the northeastern United States. Addis, J.B. Buno here with you live, everybody, on track in the tropics. You'll catch meteorologist Ian Oliver coming up here on WFLA News Channel 8, your NBC station, 8 on your side here uh, in Tampa Bay. But we're going to now start the meteorologist Q&A portion of the program where we're going to be taking your questions out of the Facebook Live comment section. And starting now, and really, uh, we have a couple comments in the queue already, but starting now, we're really looking for those hashtag Hey Addis, hashtag Hey JB comments here on Facebook Live. Let's uh, let's get to this question that uh, that's just coming in here. Uh, Rachel Emmert, uh, where is landfall expected? Hernando County Coastal here, and we've really been talking about Levi County 
uh, most of all, Addis, as far as a landfall event, but the landfall event. But really, the big thing to note here in this update that just came down from the National Hurricane Center is when Elsa does, in fact, make landfall north of the Tampa Bay area here, uh, it's expected to be as a tropical storm. There is a weakening that is now uh, expected to happen here in the hours ahead before a lunchtime landfall at some point tomorrow. Yeah, so right now it's technically still a 75 mile per hour storm, at least according to the National Hurricane Center, uh, but they do expect it to weaken to around 70 miles per hour maximum sustained. So we're talking about a five mile per hour difference. Even when this thing became a hurricane earlier this evening, the impact still stayed the same. And that is going to remain the case overnight as well. We're just talking about nuances here, five to 10 miles per hour here and there. The track of the storm hasn't changed. The wind field hasn't really changed. And the rain that we're seeing with it, that hasn't changed either. So we're still going to see these threats linger into the overnight hours. Hernando County, really all of the coastal Tampa Bay area can expect to see uh, really declining conditions here over the next several hours. You're seeing that offshore wind right now. So the surge isn't there yet, but certainly the heavy rain over the next few hours, flooding certainly possible. And we can't forget that we have that tornado watch in effect during the overnight as well. So even though the tornado risk isn't expected to be widespread, you tend to see a brief spin up sometimes as these things get close to landfall on the fright, uh, right front quadrant of the storm. So that's why we're talking about really much of the western peninsula of Florida being at least under the gun for an isolated tornado threat. So the actual landfall will take place tomorrow, likely during the late morning hours, well north of the Tampa Bay area. But by then, we're talking about that onshore wind coinciding with higher tide as well. So that's the concern that then as we head into tomorrow morning, transitioning from that heavy rain inland flooding threat then to that coastal flooding threat as we start to see that one to three foot storm surge with those onshore winds tomorrow morning. See a lot of commenters joining us here, everybody on Facebook Live using our hashtags, of course, here on Track on the Tropics, Jennifer, Kat, Holly, Pamela, Wendy, Teresa, Rebecca, Rob joining us here. Let's get to the next question, and it comes from Amanda LaRue Willis, or Wills, excuse me here, hashtag AJB. Should we expect more than what we're seeing now in Brandon, Florida currently having light rain and wind. Brandon on the east and here of the Tampa Bay area uh, here in southeastern uh, Hillsborough County. But really, I mean, we're talking about the Tampa Bay area here, especially with this question from Amanda. And uh, Amanda not seeing anything too crazy out there at this hour at us and asking if uh, has the worst arrived here yet for Tampa Bay? Uh, I would say no. Uh, just looking at the radar trends and we can show that radar here after the track. Uh, so far, the intensity of the rain uh, in general has been on the light to moderate side, at least in the immediate Tampa area. Now, I mentioned we do have that band that is uh, setting up basically from Tampa northwestward through uh, western Pasco County. So that's that initial band. But again, notice to the south, plenty more of these red colors to go. And keep in mind, the strongest wind gusts aren't going to occur until likely as we head over the next couple of hours. So we have seen those gusts down south across Sarasota over 50 miles per hour. I think those wind gusts over 50 will start to become more common across the coastal areas near Tampa Bay, also on the west coast there of the Florida Peninsula. So over the next few hours, winds will be increasing, that rain will become more intense. And then of course, as I just talked about, the coastal flooding concern then as the winds shift to more onshore. So a lot of the Tampa Bay area hasn't seen a whole lot of rain just yet, but by the time this wraps up tomorrow morning, we're likely talking about several inches of rain, hence why we're talking about that concern for even inland flooding with this thing. Yeah, and if you see on Max Fender 8 here, see that red here, but he currently near Sarasota and near Venice. That is uh, on the way for the Tampa Bay area. We got questions yep. coming up here for Polk County, Pasco County. We're going to start here with this one uh, for Ricardo Rosado here. Hashtag KJV. Will the Howard Franklin Bridge be okay to cross at 5.30 a.m.? We had John Bernier on earlier, and we were, ha we were having conversations about what the morning could look like, right? now i can say uh with with um with increasing confidence that your morning commute 5 30 a.m uh, might be okay on the howard franklin bridge but everybody keep it locked here to wfla.com the wfla app and we'll keep you posted anything uh, uh you want to add here to that Addis? Well, it looks like the core of that wind associated with the center is likely going to be to the north and west of the tampa st petersburg areas by then so 
at that point, we're probably talking more of gusts in the range of 20 to 30, maybe up to 35, 40 miles per hour. I think at that point, though, these strongest winds are going to be the, to the north. So I think it'll be okay to cross the bridge, but of course, winds are still going to be gusty, and we're not going to be done with that rain and onshore flow uh, as well. Uh, let's get to that question. I was talking about it from Wendy here. Uh, hashtag KGB. What about Polk? County here, of course, Polk County being the, uh, of course, Lakeland, Florida being the middle ground here between the Tampa Bay area, uh, I-4 all the way to Orlando. Uh, so so an inland spot here, Addis, what do we say for Wendy? Well, uh, really a similar story to what we just talked about. Now, since you are a little bit further to the east, we're not necessarily talking about, obviously, a coastal flooding concern. Uh, but the heavy rain is going to be around here through the early overnight hours. Just based on radar trends, it does appear as though the core of the wind field, as well as the heavy rainfall, is going to remain just to the west. So likely west of I-75. That's where we're talking about the greatest concern for inland flooding. Uh, certainly still there is that potential for heavy rain as far east uh, as Orlando and the I-4 corridor. But really, I'd say the heaviest rain is going to be just to the west of you. Still, though, we do have that tornado watch in effect for the overnight hours. So we have to watch as these rain bands as they come north. You get a brief spin up, you can get a quick tornado to develop. So make sure you have those alerts on overnight so that way if tornado warning is issued, you can get to your safe place in a quick matter of time. Let's get to some of those coastal communities. Pasco County, north of Tampa here. Jennifer Anders Anderson joining us. Hashtag AJB is Port Ritchie still getting hit directly. How would, how would, Addis, how would you define here a direct hit? Because we've been talking here over the course of the day on Tracking the Tropics about how, uh, you, you know, we're, you see there the center of this system, the center of circulation, really most of the concentrated worst of this is actually to the east of that center. So uh, how would you categorize a direct hit? And is a direct hit going to occur there in, uh, in Port Ritchie in the Pasco County, coastal Pasco County area? Yeah, so it's a lopsided storm. We've been talking about that, right? How all of the rain with this thing has been on the east and southeast side. Now, when it comes to the actual center of the storm, typically when we talk about a direct hit, we're talking about the eye wall, the eye coming on shore, it doesn't look like that's going to happen at this point. The eye is definitely going to stay just offshore, uh, even there in Pasco County. Now, right there in Newport Ritchie, stretching down to Clearwater, that's where that little section of the coastline juts out further to the west. So if there was an area that was more vulnerable to perhaps those more intense wind gusts, those more intense rain bands, I'd say it would be in places like Newport Ritchie, Tarpon Springs, Palm Harbor, Dunedin. Those places are going to have that concern over the next few hours. But when we're talking about a direct hit, technically, we're not going to see that just because, again, the eye itself is going to remain offshore and likely that inner eye wall as well. But that doesn't mean we can let our guard down because we are still talking about wind gusts likely in excess of 50, perhaps even 60 miles per hour across that western coastline there of Pasco County, stretching down to the south to St. Petersburg as well, along with these heavy rain bands over the next several hours. So is it a direct hit? Technically not. Does it really matter? Not really, because this is a lopsided storm, and the worst of the conditions are just to the east of the low center. Addis Juclo joining us from WHTM, meteorologist at ABC 27, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Great to have his expertise here. J.B. Buno here with you live at WFLA in Tampa on Tracking the Tropics in your Hurricane Headquarters, part of a meteorologist Q&A here on Tracking the Tropics, where we take your questions out of the Facebook Live comment section using one of the hashtags underneath our names on the left and right side of your screen, hashtag hey Addis. Hashtag KJB. We can feature your comments only if you use one of those hashtags here on Facebook Live. If you don't want to be featured, don't want to have your name on screen, just don't use a hashtag and we'll let your comment idly go on by. Now, we're talking here. We're hyper-focused here on the Tampa Bay area. We can't ignore some of what we're looking at here on the track here. So, uh, Addis is monitoring this as far as any impacts in the northeastern United States, but we're going to get to a two-for-one question here. We're going to come right back and focus in on Tampa Bay, focus in on Florida impacts but first let's get to this two for one here uh ronda lee warlick hashtag hjb how's jacksonville florida gonna weather this storm and then let's get to june and moss here hashtag hey Addis, will it stay on track after it makes landfall in wilmington north carolina here is june joining us from so uh jacksonville and wilmington north carolina really beyond that florida landfall Addis, what do you expect 
Well, the good news for both of those places, really, when we're talking about eastern Florida, the far eastern coast there, uh, the far southern coast, I should say, of North Carolina, is that we have seen this westward trend in the track over the last couple of days. So kind of like what Ian was talking about earlier, we're not going to see this track where it just kind of hugs the southeast coast. It's going into the northwest part of Florida tomorrow morning, and then it kind of drifts into southern Georgia, into South Carolina. So for Jacksonville, there will be gusty winds. There will be potentially some heavier showers, but the core of the winds here, the 40, 50, 60 mile per hour gusts should stay to the west of you. So again, we're still talking about rain from this, which could be heavy at times, but the worst will miss you in Jacksonville, likely to the west where that eye wall is going to cross. And in terms of Wilmington, North Carolina, really same story. Now, again, by that point, we're talking about more of a prolonged onshore flow up there. So there will be some perhaps storm surge concerns as far north as the Carolinas. But with that center passing well to the west of you in Wilmington, likely on the western or central side of North Carolina, you should avoid the strongest winds as well. There will be some heavier showers, some gusty winds, potentially in the order of 20, 30, 35, maybe 40 miles per hour. But in terms of the possible damaging winds, the inland coastal flooding, I'd say Wilmington avoids the worst of it. And same in Jacksonville. I'd say the worst of those conditions are going to be just to the west of you there in Jacksonville. Let's get to the next questions coming in here, everybody, on Facebook Live here on Tracking in the Tropics. We're about to show you uh, some real conditions out there from one of our camera crews in the field here in just a moment. But first, uh, let's get to Wendy Burns' comment here. Hashtag AJB. I have a daughter who lives in St. Petersburg, and I live in Boston. What type of conditions is St. Pete? Uh, looking at so we have a, a little bit of a perhaps a nervous mother here and Wendy just checking in here on tracking the tropics asking about uh, St. Pete so what do we say here for uh, for Wendy at us yep so again we're still kind of yet to see those heaviest rain bands come on shore but we are starting to see the heavier rain certainly impact the St. Petersburg area and St. Petersburg is certainly in that more vulnerable position just because they do kind of jet out of the coastline there so more and more of that water can certainly go onshore because it sticks out now that's not going to happen until we see those onshore winds kick up and that'll be when the storm moves to the north okay tomorrow morning so right now it's primarily that heavy rainfall threat we are showing you the radar right now and you can see those heaviest rain bands are still just to the south of st petersburg but again notice down towards bradenton sarasota venice right along or just east of i-75 that's where we're seeing those torrential downpours right now. And I believe we're getting a live look at St. Petersburg, JB, well, right? Well, this is actually, so, okay, this is, uh, we have a couple of different camera crews. This is Anna Maria Island that I, th I believe that we are bringing you to. So here's some of the real world impacts. Again, tapping into some of the camera crews that we have here on track in the tropics feeds um, that we can tap into here on a moment's notice. And let's get to this camera shot. This is Tampa, live from Tampa here, Bayshore and uh here we have a little bit of an angled palm tree, as you would yeah. see here uh, in tropical storm force winds or hurricane winds uh, conditions here. And so that's a live look here uh, at Tampa at us as we see some of these uh, gusts coming in here. But a lot of folks here in the comment section uh, saying that um, a lot of Floridians who have been here with us a long time saying that they have seen worse. And uh, and but then at the same time, too, we have commenters who are saying, wow, this is you know, this is our first, uh, you know, hurricane experience here since we've moved to Florida recently. So you're getting really uh, different ends of the spectrum here as far as response from uh, some of our commenters. Yeah, uh, this is nothing like, let's say, Irma that hit several right. years ago. I mean, those of you who have been living in Florida for a long time have certainly seen some much more devastating hits. Anytime we're talking about you know, high-end tropical storm, low-end category one hurricane, it's not going to be the worst of storms, but that doesn't mean you should take it lightly. You should still prepare for it, and the storm is here now. And, of course, uh, it's not really the wind that's the biggest threat with this. We've been talking about the flooding and just how many inches of rain we're going to get in this area. So on the western side of Florida, we're likely going to see areas that pick up three, four, five, maybe even six inches of rain. So whether you have lived through something like this or not, it's certainly something to keep in mind that overnight, as all this heavy rain falls into these flat areas down there, we are going to see flooding develop, and especially along those coastal areas. So certainly not the worst storm that Floridians have seen, but uh, that doesn't mean we can uh, let our guard down because there will certainly be more storms that form later this season. Again, Anis Juclo joining us from WHTM. Let's get to another 
few comments here, and really everybody, to to all of you joining us here, we can't always get to all of your questions and comments. Uh, we try to as desperately as we can, and there are times where on episodes I'll remember names of some comments that we couldn't get to in, in yeah. that episode, and we try to squeak them in in the next update, the next live meteorologist Q and A. So uh, continue to use the hashtags. Hey, add us hashtag AJB. We are trying to get to as many of those questions at this hour as possible. Alex Sedano asked this question a little bit of a while back. We're going to uh, bring it back here. Hashtag AJB. When's the circle of circulation going to be entering into the Tampa Bay area? And really, as far as the center of circulation here, Addis, uh, the center of circulation uh, is likely uh, hooking around the area, correct? Yeah, so the center of circulation is actually never going to be going through the Tampa Bay area itself. Um, the center of circulation is just going to stay off to the west. So uh, kind of like with what I was talking about a few minutes ago with the previous question, um, parts of uh, the coastal areas there near Clearwater up toward Newport Ritchie, I'd say the center will probably pass within maybe about 20, 30 miles, maybe as much as 40 miles offshore there. So it's certainly going to be close, but in terms of the immediate Tampa Bay, uh, that is not going to happen. That center of circulation is going to remain to the west. But as we've been saying many times, it doesn't necessarily matter that the center of this is missing because it's close enough that we are going to see impacts along the west coast of Florida. Uh, just a brief correction here for you folks. Uh, that was uh, Pinellas County beaches earlier. Uh, the, the one that we had here, and we'll bring this up here again. And tapping into these feeds here live. Okay. Uh, actually, this right here uh, is our crew. That's our live truck right there. That's our crews there on Bayshore Boulevard there in Tampa, uh, getting ready, getting a little bit of cover here. In, there you go. Inside a news truck. You ever been inside of a <laughs> news truck? Well, to our viewers, now you have. Uh, let's get to uh, the, that shot from earlier from Pinellas County Beaches. This one. Uh, yeah, that's Pinellas County beaches. So I said Anna Maria Island uh, earlier. I just want to kind of uh, clarify what I was talking about there. And there's our news van and an empty parking lot. This is what we're used to seeing as far as hurricane and tropical storm coverage. Uh, really not too many vehicles other than the news vehicles. And that means that a lot and of that's people good. are right that that are following uh, following the advice of the uh, smart meteorologists, of course, that are advising everybody here in the Tampa Bay area on how to uh, go about this storm. Although I got to be frank, uh, you're not going to really find that many people here in this area at 11, 1130 on a normal night, let alone a night where we have a hurricane uh, knocking on our door. Addis Juclo joining us, everybody, from uh, WHTM. Let's get to the next uh, question here. Oh, we of course, we were going to get this question eventually. Jim Barr here asking, hashtag KJB, what is the impact for Orlando? Wants to know about Disney World. Well, that's a great question. Yeah, so Central Florida is certainly going to be impacted by the storm, not as much as the western side of Florida, but when we're talking about the potential for flash flooding, because of uh, coastal rain uh, or inland rain as well, uh, Orlando is going to be at that eastern cutoff. So it, it is going to really be, I'd say, west of Orlando that sees the worst of the rain. Once you get to Orlando and just to the east, the rain is not going to be quite as intense. So I'd say the flash flood threat is just to the west of Disney. So for Orlando itself, we are going to see heavy rain at times. Some of those heavier rain bands just kind of grazing by Disney World, but most of them should stay to the west. In terms of the wind speeds, I don't think the tropical storm force winds are going to quite make it into Orlando. I think we're going to see gusts upwards of 30, maybe 40 miles per hour. Uh, but I'd say the bigger concern there is going to be some of the rain as we head uh, into the overnight hours in terms of how much rain. I'd say the Orlando area probably getting one to two inches of rain. Meanwhile, once you head to the west of Orlando, closer to the Tampa Bay area along I-4, once you get closer to coastal counties there, that's when we're going to see areas of maybe three, four, even five inches of rain. All right, being informed here, we're going to be going, this is the final really 10 or so minutes, so roughly 10 minutes here, everybody, on Track in the Tropics with Addis Duclo joining us here, everybody. So we're going to try to get to as many of your questions and really your comments. What do you think of Hurricane Elsa now that it's officially here in the Tampa Bay area? What do you think? We'll get to your comments here in the Facebook Live comment section. If you don't want to be featured on stream, just don't use one of the hashtags. But if you want us to feature your comment, use hashtag hey Addis or hashtag hey JB in the Facebook Live uh, comment section. Uh, let's get to this. This one, I can answer this one here for Chelsea. Hashtag AJB. We have flights from Ohio to Tampa for tomorrow morning. 
Will Tampa Airport be open? Tampa International Airport, TPA, of course, right here uh, in Hillsborough County, Florida. And Chelsea, I can uh, tell you that right now, TPA is closed, shut down. Uh, if we hear any information on it potentially reopening, of course, we'll pass that information along to you on WFLA.com, the WFLA app. It will reopen, of course, at some point on Wednesday morning. It's just a matter of uh, how quickly the storm and really the impacts from Hurricane Elsa clear out of the Tampa Bay area. But we will uh, try to keep you as posted as we can here as far as updates from TPX. A lot of people uh, fly in and out of that airport, one of the busier airports in the southeastern uh, United States. Myself included. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Addis was talking about TPA a short time ago. Cassandra, hashtag HJB. You know, a lot of people asking, hey, do I get a, can I stay home tomorrow and just not go to work? I wonder if that Cassandra. What if, <laughs> That's that always place, a great question. Yeah. Like, is it a, is it a hurricane day? You know, kind of like you would get a snow day from school. Is it a hurricane day? Well, Cassandra is here asking hashtag AJB. What about working tomorrow? looks like the storm will be two hour North by 8 AM. And this of course depends on where you are. If you're North of the viewing area here in like Levi County, for instance, uh, that is likely not going to be out of the viewing area just yet. You're still going to have impacts there from uh, Hurricane Elsa. Again, projected to become Tropical Storm Elsa before landfall. That's what we found out in the 11 o'clock advisory. But the Tampa Bay area, especially areas like Bradenton, Sarasota, Venice, uh, by that time tomorrow, by really by work tomorrow, uh, a lot of that area is really going to be clear for, uh, for the potential work day. Right, Addis? Yeah, I mean, the worst of these conditions really are going to be limited to over the next several hours for the immediate Tampa Bay area. So I'd say by the time most of you wake up tomorrow morning, things should be improving. Now, don't get me wrong. We're still going to have bands of showers, bands of thunderstorms, some gusty winds, certainly possible. But in terms of the, the real concern for perhaps some damaging wind gusts, uh, flooding rain, that is likely going to wrap up probably by the time the sun rises tomorrow morning. So I don't think uh, it's, it's, it's my decision. I don't think it's uh, your decision to decide uh, if tomorrow is going to be a hurricane day. But I'd say for most of the Tampa Bay metro area, things should be improving enough uh, that uh, people should be moving about their day probably as normal by tomorrow afternoon. Of course, it's also going to depend on if we have any damage tomorrow morning, if we have streets that are flooded, and if we have coastal areas that are flooded, and obviously we're not going to know that until we wake up first thing tomorrow morning. Hogwash, Addis. I say that we cancel all work across the Tampa Bay area and tomorrow. How about how about in Harrisburg too, my friend? Yeah, just every just everyone vacation day tomorrow in the Tampa Bay I'm, area. Does that sound okay? I'm good with it. I'd like I'm to. I'm good with it. Mental like health to, day. I like it. Yeah, right. Mental health day from the remnants of uh, from Elsa, or at least Elsa departing the area. That would be nice, right? Uh, let's uh, let's get to some of the other comments. Uh, Phyllis, uh, luckily, fortunately. Um, no spin-up tornadoes to mention here. Phil is asking about have any tornadoes been spotted and really haven't had that uh, that ominous tornado warning yet to tell you about. And we're hoping it would be great to get through this uh, without any tornado warnings. And uh, Ian Oliver, who was on earlier, talking about how uh, this has been a very promising sign as far as the development and progression of Tropical Storm, excuse me, Hurricane Elsa, and then Tropical Storm Elsa progressing through the area. Denise Armstrong, a uh, great question here uh, pertaining to uh, an area that we haven't really talked about yet on the stream. Uh, JB, how uh, is Gainesville going to be uh, impacted? Uh, there are, of course, still people. That, it might be the summer, but uh, there are still people, of course, at, uh, at the University of Florida there in Gainesville, and uh, they're going to be feeling impacts here shortly, Addis, I'm sure. Yes, certainly. So it looks like the center of the storm is going to pass just to the west of you in Gainesville. So really kind of similar to what we've been talking about for the Tampa Bay area. There will be some heavy rain bands, certainly some gusty winds could see some gusts in excess of 40, maybe as high as 50 miles per hour for you. Um, and, and the timing here for northern Florida is going to be probably early to mid to late morning tomorrow. That's likely when we're going to see the worst of this, and then conditions should be improving during the afternoon. So in Gainesville, you're not seeing a whole lot right now, but that is going to be changing by the time you wake up tomorrow morning as this can, as this thing continues to progress northward at about 15 miles per hour. So Gainesville, you are certainly going to see these tropical storm force winds as you are going to be close enough to the storm center. Uh, but the actual center of the storm itself, and perhaps the worst of the at least the sustained winds, uh, may stay just to the west of you, uh, closer to where the actual eye or the center of the storm is going to move. 
Yeah, and uh, uh, clarification there too. One of our commenters reminded me, and I, I have from previous experience in a different market, I say this name wrong, but it's Levy County. Levy County is where this landfall Levy. is expected to occur here. And uh, sometimes, again, from previous areas that we serve here, as far as our careers here in, uh, in both news and in weather, uh, sometimes every now and again get crossed up on pronunciations. Levy County, a landfall expected at some point on Wednesday, everybody here uh, in the state of Florida. Oh, let's get to some of the other questions and comments that are coming in here. Again, you can use hashtag uh, HeyJB. Oh, I love this question from, from Rob because it's one that we can – uh, we can answer here, everybody, uh, in, 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 in a certain respect. And Rob asking here, hashtag AJB, I live in Pasco County. If we lose power here, how soon are they going to repair and restore power? And I will tell you that, and, and Addis knows exactly what, what I'm talking about here, just like Syracuse, New York, or Rochester, New York, or uh, some of the snow-laden areas of the Northeast are equipped to deal with a lot of snow on the ground and getting rid of that snow and clearing the roads in a short amount of time. Florida really equipped to restore power in a brief amount of time. So I can't tell you uh, what, how exactly long it would be, if it would be an hour or six hours, but I know that, uh, that we are really, really, really lucky to have some of the great power crews down here uh, in Florida that are – just so great at expeditiously getting power restored to thousands of customers when the lights do in fact go out here in the state of Florida. Yeah, this storm has been certainly followed for days now. We knew that it was going to take this track right along the coast. So I'd say the preparedness certainly has been there and the crews are ready for it. So at this point, again, we're not talking about category two, three, four, force winds. You know, we're talking about wind gusts in Pasco County along the coast, maybe upwards of 50, as high as 60 miles per hour. So yes, that could certainly cause damage, but how widespread the damage is gonna be, likely not. Uh, so any power outages that we do have tomorrow morning, I'd be willing to bet are resolved quickly. Uh, obviously, like JB said, we can't say exactly when, but I think uh, given the preparedness, uh, we've heard about how the power crews are standing by and ready. I I'd say it probably uh, shouldn't be too much of a concern in how long it's going to come back. Let's get to another uh, a great question that just came in here from David Cutright here. Hashtag hey JB, what is the current speed of this storm? And uh, we can explain for our viewers that the speed in which a system moves, uh, a system such as ELSA moves, is so critically important. And here's why, of course, the, the slower that it moves, the longer that the impacts are felt. Faster moving storms are always preferred because it'll breeze over an area more quickly versus, we, you know, we've talked about other previous storms here on Track in the Tropics that linger, dump torrential rain, bring all of that terrible, uh, those terrible wind gusts over a particular area for an extended period of time. So the wind speed here, Addis, is the question from David Cutright. Yeah, so it's the moving speed, north excuse me, at, excuse me, the moving speed, moving speed. Correct. Yeah, I got you. Um, north at 14 miles per hour. So that is the current speed of the storm. Um, that is about average, maybe a little faster than average for a tropical storm. So earlier in the week, uh, when we were talking about this thing moving near Cuba, it was flying at about 20, 30 miles per hour. So it's been slowing down since, but it has been moving steadily here at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. And we're, we'll, hopefully we're going to keep this thing cruising along. Of course, the concern is because it is moving parallel to the coast, it is going to be collecting all that water, but it is a progressive storm. And notice with that track, how those lines start to get further apart with time. The implication there is that the storm is going to be picking up speed. So as we head into tomorrow, as we head into Thursday for the southeast and mid-Atlantic, the good news is the storm is going to continue to move along faster. We only got a couple more minutes, folks, here on Track in the Tropics. Addis Duclo joining us from WHTM, ABC 27 in Harrisburg, uh, Pennsylvania. Great to have him on the program here. Max Defender right there on the center of your screen. Really what I want to get into now, because I've seen some of these questions come in. For our audience here on the WFLA Facebook page specifically now, uh, I want you to use hashtag KJB. Tell me where you're located and whether or not you have power. Now, I've seen that a lot of folks have been commenting here back and forth saying, 
I'm from here, I'm from there, I'm from here, I'm from there. I do have power, I don't have power. Let's uh, get a little bit of a conversation going because uh, we haven't really talked about power outages, but power outage is likely happening right now. At any moment, you could see the lights flicker in your home or uh, where you are, or where, whether you're, uh, you're at work or, or if you're uh, at your residence. Um, so let us know where you're, two things, location, and whether you have power, and make sure you use that hashtag HeyJB or hashtag HeyAddis, and uh, we'll kind of uh, rattle them off here as far as some areas that do and do not have power here uh, at this era, uh, at this hour. Really quickly, while we get to some of those comments coming in here regarding power, really quickly, give us a, a quick tidbit here, Stacy uh, from Stacy Addis, hashtag HeyJB, what about Daytona Beach? Yeah, so da Daytona Beach, you're obviously on the eastern side of Florida there. So the impacts are not going to be as bad there. So I mentioned Jacksonville. Jacksonville was just going to miss out on the worst of the conditions because the core of the storm is going to pass to the west. Similar in, da in Daytona Beach, I think even more so in terms of how much rain. I think a reasonable expectation in Daytona Beach is maybe one to two inches of rain. So, yes, you're going to see rain from this, but you're not going to see the heaviest of the downpours. And the, certainly the strongest winds are going to stay on the opposite side of the peninsula. So da Daytona Beach. Things are looking good for the most part. Again, we're going to have some showers, perhaps some rumbles of thunder here into the overnight hours for you. But if you're on the eastern side of Florida, uh, you're looking pretty good, at least when it comes to the storm. Stacy followed up with her comment saying that Daytona Beach, of course, yes, the, they, they've got power. That's, of course, uh, good news. Okay, let's rattle these off as quickly as possible here while I'll let Addis kind of just check uh, the latest that's coming in here, everybody, as far as the data and the models. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, starting with Josh here. Josh Keffer, hashtag KJB power still on in Pasco. Evangeline uh, Lutz, I have power. Nina Farley, South Venice, they have power uh, there. Uh, Heather Hall, hashtag KJB, I'm from St. Pete. I do have power, but do I need to be worried? Uh, don't need to be worried. Don't panic. Don't panic. Um, we're, as a commenter noted earlier, we are ready for this and just stay informed and, uh, and uh, we'll keep you posted here. But, um, you know, there's still a, a good amount of uh, of stuff to track here as far as the St. Pete area, but um, no need to panic. Uh, yeah, Susan, and it is – oh, I'm sorry, JP. Oh, yeah, go right ahead. No, it, is, it is a good sign that places to the south – so I believe somebody mentioned uh, Venice yep. had power. So places to the south where the core of this thing is moving through right now, if you still have power down there, that is a good sign for places to the north as the center of the storm approaches. Now, obviously, it's not a guarantee, but uh, it's good to hear the places down further south along I-75 are still uh, with, with power, at least in that comment. Uh, the comments, I, I can't keep up. Okay, um, yeah. uh, power is still on in Hudson, according to Andrea. Uh, Denise has power in Sarasota. Uh, let's see here. Um, a lot of folks uh, saying that they have power. Uh, Spencer Harrison, South Tampa near McDill uh, Air Force Base. Yes, I have power still. Thank you guys for all the chiming in here. Um, uh, Port Ritchie has power, according to Tiffany. Nicole says yes in the Brandon area. They, too, uh, have power. Uh, Laura joining us here from St. Petersburg. Power on in St. Pete. Uh, Lisa joining us from St. Pete Beach, saying that they have power as well. Tony, Springfield, ha Spring Hill has a uh, has has power uh winter haven uh kimberly's joining us from there uh florida yeah they have they have power in winter haven florida and uh let's see here plant city pablo joining us has power there i'm gonna try to catch up here as quickly as i can uh let's see here power in parish florida according to betsy downtown st pete uh laura says that she has power and uh, let's see, uh, Williston, Florida, checking in. Power is still on, according to Jennifer. Should we expect more severe weather? Uh, Gainesville, and we just talked about Gainesville. I think that they're going to be getting some of, this, uh, of these impacts here from Elsa here in the hours ahead. Uh, and Lakeland has power, uh, according to Tish. No power in Sarasota. Okay, so there's one. No power in Sarasota, according to uh, Cindy Parrish here in the comment section. And we look at Max Defender 8 and you see what Sarasota is going through with Venice, Sarasota, Bradenton kind of going through at this hour. Not surprising that we have some outages there in the southern end of the viewing area as far as Tampa Bay is concerned here at us. Yeah, and, and just from a meteorological perspective, when we're looking over the satellite right now, and I know we're not going to show that here, but the satellite does show some of the coldest cloud tops, some of the more intense thunderstorm activity is right down south in that area closer to Sarasota. And you can actually see that on the radar when it pops up. You'll see that very intense band of red right down south, 
stretching from just east of Venice, north of Port Charlotte, stretching north and northwestward toward Bradenton. So that's that band that could cause some trouble here over the next few hours, as that right now is the most intense convection or thunderstorm activity with this storm. So under that, you can certainly expect heavy wind, or heavy rain, very heavy rain, strong wind gusts. And of course, as we head over the next few hours, somewhere in that band, there may be a quick spin up. And that's why there is that tornado watch in effect through the night tonight. Yeah, and I'm also going to kind of talk here as a second as I queue up another comment here that just came in that caught my eye. Uh, you know, it, it's really, it's really terrific that we can talk to people like this even if they do lose power you know 20 30 years ago you lose power and you lose access to local meteorologists you lose access to that information unless you have a weather radio but you can't really see this information coming literally into the palm of your hand but because people have mobile devices and they can access the internet provided that you have you know your your neighborhood cell tower uh, is still operational you can still watch you could be sitting in a completely dark household and have us on here on Tracking the Tropics going out to, of course, apps, websites, and social media platforms. So uh, just a big affordance that we have here being able to reach you. Even if the lights do go out, we can still have that conversation with you, provided that you have your, you know, as we talk about it, got to have your phone charged and having those battery chargers, uh, those mobile batteries uh, with you so that you can plug in to that mobile battery. It's just really, it, it's expected now. It's really crucial for people to have. Yeah, and we always talk about having multiple ways to get warnings. Obviously, TV is great being able to tune into your WFLA meteorologist, but when the power goes out, that's when you need things like weather radio or your smartphone, making sure that those wireless emergency alerts are on. So that way, whenever something is issued, your phone will go off. And that really has saved so many lives here in the last 10 or 20 years. Just the fact that we are able to get these warnings out to people faster it's great to see, and it's certainly great to see in situations like this as well when we're talking to folks about a landfalling tropical storm. Again, Addis Juclo joining us. We're, uh, two more final co comments here. Hashtag, hey, JB from Andrea, raining hard in Hudson now. And, uh, yeah, I would anticipate that Hudson's starting to see some of those impacts. And Marcy here with a, with a kind comment. Thank you for your fantastic coverage. Praying for my son in the Bay. Hashtag worried mama a lot of moms checking in on their kids down here in florida i thought it was usually the other way around that it was uh it was the the younger folks in uh in, in cities across the country checking in on their parents and grandparents in florida kind of a lot of comments of people checking in on their kids in florida here uh i, I think uh just a, a funny sort of uh development that we've had here over the course of the day on track in the tropics they, Addis, they, they really do care <laughs> they really do. Everybody, go follow Addis Juclo on social media. He's a great, great meteorologist. WHTM Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Can't thank him enough for his time. More co coverage coming up here ahead on Tracking in the Tropics here, everybody, as we continue to monitor all the developments with Hurricane Elsa. Thank you for watching Tracking the Tropics.